again. Uh, you know, I, I've been telling you guys as we've gone through, I, I'm, a big, I'm a big fan of the Senate Conservatives Fund. I'm a big fan of the Madison Project. I'm a big fan of the Heritage Action for America. And typically, when you see me write out lists of organizations that I say, you know, you, you can give money to this organization because you can trust this organization because they're an honest broker. And one of the reasons that I say this with these groups is because there is a movement in Washington, D.C. among a number of establishment folks who undermine the credibility of these organizations by attacking them for doing exactly what the organizations are that are attacking them, uh, by daring to spend money. and. You know, these organizations, they spend money on the conservative cause. They spend money to fight for freedom and fight for liberty. And one of the groups that gets routinely attacked by people in Washington, D.C. who hate that they're forcing change on the system is FreedomWorks. FreedomWorks is inevitably over the target, dropping bombs exactly where they need to be dropped, uh, fighting, rallying conservatives, libertarians, people of the center-right coalition around the country. They're fighting for freedom. Because freedom does work. And it, I, every day in Washington, another hit comes out on this organization, along with these other organizations. And so that's why I, I make a point of standing here and telling you, I know these people. I know their organizations. I know what they do. The fact that they're getting attacked means they are working. They are putting points on the board for smaller government. And I'm just, I, I was actually really excited to find out. Matt and I have never actually been at a conference together where, where we're on stage talking and, and being a part of the same thing. I'm a big believer in freedom works. I'm a big believer that freedom works. I'm a big believer in the organization that is committed to making freedom work. I'm a big supporter of Matt Kibbe, a big fan, and I'm just absolutely delighted he can be here to talk to you guys today. So you never know exactly what I'm going to say on stage because I never really decide until I step up here. But listening to the conversation yesterday and Eric's introduction today and this common enemy that red state fans and FreedomWorks activists have, it's sort of on my mind. Earlier this week, Steve LaTourette, one of my favorite people in Washington. Do you guys all know who this is? If you want to know the gory t details about him, check out Eric's blogs on the subject. But he wrote a piece in Politico called The Grifters versus the Governing Wing of the Republican Party. And he accused me personally, along with Jenny Beth Martin from Tea Party Patriots and Chris Chicola from uh, Club for Growth, of being grifters. They were just in it for the money. And, and, it's, and we're trying to hoodwink activists into thinking that you can actually see change in Washington. I'm, I'm guilty of that, by the way. <laughs> and it, you know, it's, it, it, his, his article, if you've read it, it's a, it's a, it's a classic case of, of projection, right? Because we all know that not just Steve La Tourette, but a, a seeming army of lobbyists are trying to hijack the Republican Party. And I don't understand how it's possible, if you're a lobbyist, you're paid by your clients, and I, by the way, I'm not against lobbying, I, I'm just for transparency on this question. If you're a lobbyist, you are paid by clients to advocate certain positions, quite typically the big money in lobbying comes from advocating more government. There's very few, very few lobbyists that will come into a congressman's office and ask for less government, right? Uh, Steve LaTourette happens to represent transportation interests and hospital interests that were very invested in, in Obamacare, in public television, and all sorts of interests that would be anathema to the stated principles of the Republican Party and certainly the stated principles of the conservative and liber liberty movements. But when he goes on TV, He's a Republican strategist. Have you met these guys? You always got to use the danger quotes whenever you see the phrase Republican strategist, because that's code for lobbyist who has an agenda. And in Steve LaTourette's case, 
I understand what he's trying to do. I actually debated him on Fox News Sunday once, and I was, it, it'd be interesting to go back and watch this because we were debating the future of the Republican Party, and I was talking about how we all together had, had proceeded to repopulate the GOP with a lot of young, energetic, principled talent. You've talked to some of these people today and yesterday. And I talked about Ted Cruz, and I talked about Rand Paul, and I talked about Mike Lee and Raul Labrador and Marco Rubio and Tim Scott. All of these people that anyone would point to as a leader of the Republican Party, you guys did that, right? So I'm talking about that. And Steve LaTourette somewhat randomly brings up technical provisions in the transportation bill that we had just helped kill. And I'm sitting there on live TV saying, I wonder who you're billing this to? What transportation interests were, were most pissed off that, that we killed that particular pr provision in that transportation bill? And what on earth does that have to do with the future of the Republican Party? Absolutely nothing. So we have this problem in the Republican Party. We have this problem in the conservative movement. It's almost, if there, anyone here is a, is a fan of Game of Thrones, it's a little bit like White Walkers descending on Westeros or zombies seeking out fresh brains, right? They're, they're relentless. They have their agenda. They're not going to stop. We're going to have to stop them. But in fairness to Steve LaTourette, he's not the only one. And, and I, I could list a bunch of these guys, and, and they've been sort of infecting the Republican Party since we took the majority in 1994. And it's very easy to make a lot of money doing the wrong thing in Washington. It's a seller's market. You, you can rock and roll if that's what you want to do. But he has a point. Um, he calls me a grifter. I'm going to come clean today for all of you for the first time ever. I'm, I'm going to clean out my closet. I'm not really a grifter, but I, I, think, I think he would have been accurate if he had called me a drifter, because I am a recovering Republican. <laughs> and I started in this movement when I was 13 years old. I was reading the, the album cover from a band called Rush, and, and they dedicated it to the genius of Ayn Rand, and I immediately went out and found a copy of Anthem, and I started to devour um, all of the, the, the sacred texts of the liberty movement. And by the time I was 16 or 17, I was reading Ludwig von Mises. By the way, if you're 16 or 17 and you want to meet girls, do not quote Ludwig von Mises. <laughs> they do not care at all. But doing so gives you more time to read books because you won't get a date. So I read all of those books. And I went to Grove City College in Pennsylvania and discovered that a professor there, a guy named Hans Senholtz, any Grove City fans? There's at least a couple. My professor, Hans Senholtz, had gotten his PhD from Ludwig von Mises. And unbeknownst to me, he was mentoring this newish congressman from Texas you may have heard of, a guy named Ron Paul. So yes, I'm one of those guys. And I know that. It's scary, but, but I'm, a, I'm a small L libertarian. I believe in liberty. I have since I was a, a, a young person. And I wanted to be an academic. So I, I came down to Washington, D.C. to go to, to uh, George Mason University. And somewhere along the way, I started interning for what is now FreedomWorks. And I got to see, when I was just a kid, Ronald Reagan give a speech in the White House in 1986. Keep in mind, I'm an academic. I'm reading all these books. I'm not paying attention to politics. I'm, I'm, I'm happily unaware of the mess that is the two-party duopoly in Washington, DC. But I go see Ronald Reagan give a speech. And it was so awesome. He was talking about opportunity. He was talking about how liberty creates unknown potential for each of us, and that there's no pecking order. There's no system in the United States that decides who wins and who loses. It's up to you. He actually quoted Ludwig von Mises. How many presidents have quoted Ludwig von Mises? So I'm like, wow, this is cool. I didn't know it before, but as of today, I'm a Republican. 
because I thought that Ronald Reagan was just like every other Republican. I went to work for the Republican National Committee about a year later, and I went to work for Lee Atwater, and I remember the interview to this day. Um, I told my boss in the interview when he said, why do you want to do this? I want to make sure that George H.W. Bush doesn't break his promise on taxes. So I'm young and naive and excited because I'm working for the party of Reagan, and I am the senior economist at the Republican National Committee, and it would have been my job to defend the Bush tax increase. It was one of those teachable moments that our president talks about a lot. I suddenly realized that the Republican Party is not exactly what I thought it was, and I better do a little more research on this. I had to leave the Republican Party, or at least the RNC. I had to go to my boss and say, would you please let me out of my two-year commitment? Because as your chief economist, I cannot defend raising higher taxes to boost the economy. Luckily, I found a bastion of freedom. It was called the US Chamber of Commerce. I left the Republican National Committee to be the budget director at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. This is a true fact story. And as naive as I was at the time, I looked at the, the logo at the front door of the U.S. Chamber, this big marble building right across from the White House. It says the spirit of enterprise. I'm like, I'm one of those guys. I believe in free enterprise, so I'm going to work for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I suddenly discovered that the chamber wasn't about free enterprise. Two, almost two years later, I had to leave the Chamber of Commerce as they endorsed Hillary Care. As the budget director, I would have had to explain why a government takeover of health care would be good for our goal of balancing the budget. I, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do that job, so I had to leave that. You know, people today that are surprised by the chamber don't understand their history. What's happening, what happened at the chamber is the same thing that's happening to the Republican Party today. The big interests that have an interest in government control of health care took over the policymaking process at the chamber. All the small guys, the guys that are trying to make a payroll, the guys that are worried about whether or not um, they can afford health care for any of their employees, they don't have a seat at that table. Those of you that remember this fight, I was talking to someone earlier today and telling this story, the National Federation of Independent Businesses cleaned up, stole all the Chamber's small members because NFIB was against Hillary Care while the Chamber was for it. So now they're even more dependent on the big interests that want a special deal from Washington. If that sounds like today's GOP, um, you understand the dynamic. It's a bit of a death spiral. So I left the chamber, and I went to Capitol Hill. I was the chief of staff for a, a Republican congressman. But it took me a long time to figure out how things actually work. And sometimes the things that people tell you in Washington, I don't want to shock you guys, sometimes they lie. So that's my dirty laundry. I've, I've, been, uh, I've been hoodwinked and bamboozled more than once thinking that the people that espouse the principles of liberty and limited government and individual opportunity actually mean it. But I'm not that fooled anymore. And you aren't either because something has changed. Back when I was a kid trying to find liberty, it was hard. It was hard to find the books. It was hard to find other people that thought about liberty the way we did. It was hard to believe that there was anybody in America that was worried about the future of the country. It's not so hard anymore. This thing called the internet, what does it do? It, it decentralizes everything. It disintermediates the political process so that all of the experts in Washington who are telling you one thing while you're busy doing your jobs and raising your families and, and hoping that Washington minds its own business, now you can actually check up on them. 
And not only do you check up on them, but an entire army of bloggers at Red State check up on them every day, and you get it through your RSS feed, and you know in real time what they're actually doing in Washington. So when they come back to your state, and they come back to your community and say, I'm a small government conservative, you whip out your smartphone and say, well, explain this. This is why they're so angry at us because accountability hurts. And all of that power that used to be centralized in Washington, and not just in the, in the RNC, but also in the DNC, not just in, in Speaker Boehner, but Speaker Pelosi, all of that power is disintermediating back to you. This should be the biggest opportunity that you and I have had in our entire lifetimes. Having done this for 25, 30 years, I'm not, I couldn't be more excited about what we can do together. How many people are fairly new to the, to the movement? How many people have been doing this a long time? So the, the community that we've built together, and you can call it the Tea Party, you can call it Constitutional Conservative, you can call it 912, you can call it the Liberty Movement. I don't really care what the brand is, but the values very much bind us together. And by the way, those values were not created from a group in Washington, D.C. They didn't come from Freedom Works. Um, to be honest with you, I stole them from your mom. <laughs> and she stole them from her mom, who probably stole it from church on Sunday, right? There's a tradition in America. It's, we're genetically encoded with these values. And what social media and the internet and the disintermediation of the old Walter Cronkite, this is the way it is model. What's that, what that's doing is it's waking up a lot of people who didn't have an ability to get connected, to know what was going on. And when you do the math and you stack up all the Steve LaTourette's, you can stack them up like cordwood over on this side of the stage. And those of us that believe in liberty over here, there's a lot more of us than there are of them. After I finished reading Ludwig von Mises, I started reading F.A. Hayek. And I think for those of you who want to geek out a little bit, you've got to read a little bit of Hayek, because he talks about the market as a spontaneous order. And he talks about the beauty of this system where every single one of us has a unique perspective, has unique understandings and knowledge of time and place, of the things that we want to do, the things we care about for our family. And somehow, we all come together in our communities from the bottom up and create something that is so much bigger than any one of us could have designed by ourselves. Someone should explain this process to Barack Obama. <laughs> because the progressives, on the other hand, they don't believe in, in, the, in the genius of people solving things together on a voluntary basis at the community level. They believe that there's somebody smarter than you and better than you. And if we just gave them enough of your money and enough power, they could redesign everything and it would be really beautiful. Think, think about Lois Lerner for a second and tell me how that's going to work out. Of course, this process of voluntary cooperation, the process of creating something that's so much bigger than yourself is the basis of communities. Communities are made up of individuals. Someone should tell Barack Obama that. I did a long empirical study on this question, and it turns out that every single community is made up of individuals. Have you guys noticed this? <laughs> I was shocked. Because in Washington, guys like Barney Frank say things like, you know, um, government is what we do together. <laughs> Apparently, he's never been in a community before. Because it's really about people voluntarily associating and doing things that, that you have to do. Because you look in the mirror every morning, and you realize if you don't do it, maybe no one's going to get it done. This is why you help your neighbor. That same ethos is now applied to reigning in Washington. That same ethos 
is now applied. I forgot to start my timer, so there's no point in doing it now. <laughs> to the takeover of the Republican Party. Steve LaTourette in his piece where he so criticizes me and Jenny Beth and Chris, he embraces the mantle of Ronald Reagan, which I, which I thought was particularly beautiful. And he, he quotes Ronald Reagan saying that anybody that agrees with me 80% of the time is my friend. Well, I'm a libertarian, and libertarians really aren't comfortable until they've chased every single person out of the room, right? Yeah. <laughs> Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> and we're getting over this. And, and the, the realization is that there's, there's only one perfect libertarian, there's only one perfect conservative, and it's probably you. And everybody else is a little squishy around the sides, right? <laughs> So I'm all for the 80% thing. I'm good with that. <laughs> Steve LaTourette forgets to mention an awesome interview that, that Ronald Reagan gave in 1975. A friend of mine, Manny Klausner at Reason Magazine, those, those crazy, zany libertarians, um, got an interview with, with Reagan after he, he, he left the governor's mansion. And, and, he's, and Reagan says, the heart and soul of conservatism is libertarian. And the word conservatism is really a misnomer because if it was back in the days of Thomas Jefferson, we would be liberals. And the liberals would be Whigs. Tories, not Whigs. Why is it that the left steals all of our language? I call myself a community organizer and people recoil in, in fear. <laughs> but what do you think the Boston Tea Party was? That was our thing, that wasn't their thing. Liberal. If you go to Europe and you talk to a liberal politician, you're probably talking to someone like Ted Cruz. Liberal means respect for the dignity of the individual and keeping government out of your lives. But, they've, but they stole that word, and then they trashed it. So now we have to call them progressives because nobody likes a liberal anymore. Well, people are starting to figure out what a progressive is again. And I, what are they, what are they, are they going to call themselves conservative next? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, we're at this beautiful moment. How many people are, are pessimistic about, about the future after the primary season? It's pretty frustrating, and particularly in Mississippi. I spent a lot of time down there, and man, was that vicious, what they did to us there. It's pretty vicious in Kentucky, too. And vicious in a lot of places. My human timer just showed up. Keep talking. But let me, let me, let me close by, by suggesting that we're just getting started here. And, and the trend that you saw in 2009 when we marched on Washington and the trend that you saw in 2010 when we enabled the most historic shift in election outcomes since 1947 and the addition of guys like Ted Cruz in 2012 and the growth of the Freedom Caucus even in 2014. We didn't win everything we wanted to and frankly I don't expect to. It's hard to beat a, an entrenched senator that's been in that office for 10,000 years. Sort of like digging up dinosaur bones. It's not easy. Um, but the good guys are winning. And the Republican Party needs to come to terms with the fact that the, the new rules are not going away. And it has nothing to do with Freedom Works. You can try to take out Matt Kibbe. You can try to take out Ted Cruz. You can try to take out Eric Erickson. You can go after all the leaders the way that Saul Alinsky would tell you to do. And it doesn't matter because it's you guys. It's millions and millions of you guys with better tools and better information and the values that bind us together as a community. They're not going to stop us. Are you guys going to give up? No. That's what I want to hear. Thank you so much. Do you have a question? No. We've got time for just a couple of questions. If somebody wants to ask a question. Maybe we'll take these two questions. Go ahead. 
I just uh, wonder if there's some way to herd the cats. We, you can't knock out a sitting congressman without probably $450,000 in Texas. And I gave 1000 to Katrina and 750 to uh, Frank Kuchar. But if, if I could do one thing, if we could just pick one a year, everybody gives all the money to that district, and then we'll go get your guy next time. Yeah. Any <laughs> ideas? I mean, I know there's a lot of personalities involved, but it's, it's just wasting money, this, this process. They, and they don't have to talk, the incumbent doesn't have to talk to a single voter. They just call ADM PAC and ask how much you need, and that's it. It's done. Yep. Yep. So the, the, the challenge, of some of the lessons that we could draw from some of these primaries is if, if everybody gets behind one candidate, your likelihood of success goes up exponentially. Um, and that's what happened with Ted Cruz, right? Every, everybody pretty early on, <laughs> and there were other good guys in that race, you guys will remember. Um, the other problem, I think, is that there are only, only so many Ted Cruz's waiting in the wings. Because it's not enough to believe the right thing, you actually have to have the practical skills to run a statewide campaign, you have to know how to handle yourself in front of a hostile media, um, and sometimes first-time candidates can't do that. Um, but I, th I think the answer is to build the farm team. And I've been talking to people here all weekend about how they're taking over their local um, Republican Party apparatus, how they're getting involved in state races and county council races, that kind of thing. Um, in some ways, those, those are the talent pool moving forward. But I also agree with what Eric said yesterday. I think we should look for citizen legislators. And if we build the grassroots machinery outside of the formal process, you can do things like Dave Bratt did against Eric Cantor. That was, that was a perfect example of what Hayek was talking about. There was a, a spontaneous coming together and everything worked just right. It had nothing to do with money. Dave Brett had no money. Um, so, but I would be wary, and if you guys have ever tried to tell libertarians and conservatives what to do, <laughs> do not go there. So we gotta work through this process, but I think we also need to realize that if we do come together around a candidate, we're gonna win. But if we spend a lot of time fighting in the primaries, we might not win. Um, my question could be colored for, by the fact that I live in New York City, which is blue, blue, blue. And my feeling is that we've reached a tipping point and we're tipping the wrong way. Um, is my view realistic because you see more around the country or um, can you give us some hope? Yeah, I, I, I think the opposite is happening. And, and I say that as someone that's been involved in politics and I, I shared all my dirty laundry with you guys. Um, but in 1995, when Republicans took the House and they started pushing the contract with America, in the Senate, Bob Dole was majority leader, and the closest approximation to a conservative was Phil Graham. And there was only one Phil Graham. Today, there's at least five guys in the US Senate that are more conservative than Phil Graham. This is historically unprecedented. The Liberty Caucus and the fact that they couldn't take out Justin Amash and the, and the growth of that community in the House, historically unprecedented. It did not exist in 1994. Appreciate that it takes a long time to turn the Titanic, and I understand the iceberg is there, but we are actually doing that. Thank you. Matt, look, before you get off the stage, I want to tell you, I am a, a genuinely big fan of what you guys do at FreedomWorks. I think very, very highly of the organization and what you've been able to turn it into and what folks across the country have been able to do. And just I hope that FreedomWorks continues to grow in every state. Thank you, sir. It's an honor. honor to be